Today, Dan Ingalls of SSL and his father, Professor Daniel Ingalls of Harvard University, will be giving a talk entitled Sanskrit and OCR. Dan Ingalls is a member of the Learning Research Group at PARC and spends his time at PARC designing and implementing the Smalltalk programming system. Professor Ingalls is the Wales Professor of Sanskrit and Indian Studies at Harvard University. His published work includes books on such topics as Indian logic, and translations of Sanskrit court poetry. He's also editor of the Harvard Oriental Series. Professor? My son Dan and I are engaged in uh, a project that combines historical analysis and uh, computer techniques in a rather original way. Uh, he asked me to talk to you about the historical dimension of this project, and uh, afterwards he will describe the manner in which he has used computer techniques to solve these problems. Uh, <coughs> it uh, may be simplest to start with the concrete situation and then work backward to the basic problems and goals of the project. For many years, uh, I have been studying a Sanskrit work called the Mahabharata. This is an immense poem. It's about twice the length of the Bible and uh, just about as various in its contents. It has one great difference from the Bible. It contains no datable events. And so it's been a great puzzle to scholars uh, what parts of it may be earlier and what parts may be later. The presumption is that it was not written by one man and that it was written over a very long period of time. And you see estimates uh, composed between 500 B.C. and 300 A.D. Uh, when people have tried to assign certain portions to an earlier period or to a later period, it has been largely on subjective or at least on grounds that are not provable. Now, it seemed to me a reasonable hypothesis that the earlier portions of this poem were orally composed, that is, composed without the use of writing. And I discovered a number of ways in which you can characterize orally composed Sanskrit and can count up the stylistic uh, uh, characters within a given length of text that, that point to that conclusion. Uh, so I began by hand uh, listing uh, these stylistic characters, and that got very wearisome. Uh, Donald suggested that uh, I use a computer to count them up, so I hired a telex machine, and during one summer vacation, I typed out a transcription of 3,000 32 syllable shlokas of the Mahabharata and uh, told Danny what I wanted to find out. And it produced very interesting results. Actually, I've read three papers uh, on those results before the American Oriental Society. And they bear out the hypothesis very nicely. There are portions of the Mahabharata that were orally composed, and there are other portions that were not. But uh, to assign each part of this work to its proper chronological layer, you've got to make a concordance of the whole. Uh, you've got to have uh, an index of every word that is in the poem. And it became very obvious to me from my summer of typing that long before I got through the Mahabharata, <laughs> I was going to die of boredom <laughs> and there would be no point in the whole project. It was then uh, that Donald said, well, uh, if you could present the printed text of the Mahabharata uh, to a scanner, and if you could teach that scanner to recognize Devanagari script, it's not in Latin script, the printed edition, <coughs> why, that would save you all the trouble of typing. Uh, now, the problem of getting a computer to recognize the components of a Devanagari script 
are really of a very high order of difficulty. And I uh, will let Danny show you, I mean, he will show you later uh, how he has solved that problem. We now have uh, a computer uh, whose recognition is 99.5% correct. And uh, it turns out it's not really worthwhile getting it to do even better than that because we're going to have to edit in a good many things by hand anyhow. Uh, now to turn to the uh, underlying problems, uh, let me speak first of Sanskrit and then of the Mahabharata in particular. Uh, Sanskrit is a language. Uh, the word itself, Sanskritam, means perfected. Uh, it's basically the Classical Sanskrit is basically uh, the spoken language of northwestern India of about 600 BC. Its uh, perfection consists in its having been refined by several generations of grammarians. Uh, we have older examples of pre refined Sanskrit that go back to around 1200 BC, and it was those ancient examples that first caught the imagination of of Western scholars, particularly when they found that this ancient language belongs to the uh, same language family that English and most of the languages of Europe also belong to. Uh, one could have guessed this from certain uh, archaic words. The most archaic words, as you probably know, are for close family relationships or for the numerals. Uh, you take father is pater in Latin and pater in Greek and pitter in Sanskrit or brother, which is brata in Sanskrit. You take the numerals tu in English. Old English it was twa. Sanskrit it's dwa. Uh, three is trayach and so forth. Uh, what has interested me more than this uh, uh, ancient uh, uh, member, than the, than the linguistic uh, fact of the archaism of Sanskrit, is the huge literature which arose in this language in later times. Sanskrit became, uh, culturally speaking, the Latin of South Asia. It spread from northwest India through the whole of India and on into Indonesia. All the oldest inscriptions in Indonesia, Indochina, even as far as Borneo, are written in Sanskrit. And there is an immense literature in this language. All the basic works of Hinduism and of Buddhism. Uh, you have uh, vast collections of mythology, ritual, philosophy, the ancient sciences, or what they called sciences, some of them were very strictly so, uh, the, the grammar, logic, uh, astronomy, medicine. Uh, practically, well, 95% of what is preserved uh, from uh, India before the Muslim conquest is written in Sanskrit, and it's continued to be written on up to the present. Uh, you have, in addition to these rather formidable and serious texts of literature I've been speaking of, you have all the court literature of plays and love poems and tales of a delightful collections of stories. Uh, just to give you a rough indication of, of what there is, uh, the great catalog of Sanskrit manuscripts is being prepared in Madras now, called the Catalogus Catalogorum. Uh, <laughs> when it's completed, we'll list well over a million Sanskrit manuscripts that are still preserved. <coughs> and of course, there's a good bit of duplication in that, but even if you got rid of the duplication, uh, you would probably have enough to fill 50 or 60,000 volumes. No, I think it will, right? Uh, now, one uh, peculiarity of this literature uh, is that much of the ancient portion of it was preserved for many centuries by memory, not in the form of written texts. Uh, again, this often surprises people uh, that large amounts of literature can be preserved by memory, and it also surprises them to know 
that there have been many centuries when the art of writing was known, but books were not written. And the reason is that to have books written, you need two things. You needed the technique of the symbolism of, of, of writing, but you also need cheap writing materials. And if you look at the form in which the earliest Sanskrit writings occur, uh, chiseled into stone, it was not an easy way in which to write a poem of 200,000 lines. <laughs> what finally produced books in India was the discovery of cheap writing materials. They began to use birch bark and particularly palm leaf. And palm leaf gave India its literacy just as papyrus gave literacy to uh, the Greco-Roman world. Now, uh, there are two ways in which a literature can be preserved by memory. Uh, you, in the case of, of magical chants or essential rituals, they have to be memorized word by word. And that's the way the Indians memorized the sacred Vedas and they invented special mnemonic techniques for doing that. They would memorize not only the text straight, but they had systems of memorizing word one, word three, word two, word four, word three, word five. Uh, it's extraordinary. They go through 10,000 verses with this kramapata, uh, this uh, double check on themselves, so that not a single word could be forgotten, not a single accent could be misplaced. But the majority, of the literature that was preserved in memory was not preserved in this way. What was memorized was the content, and it was freshly presented each time. Uh, this is particularly true of the epic. This Mahabharata I've been speaking of uh, began as an epic, although it ended up as an encyclopedia. Uh, uh, epics are recited in the oral tradition, extempore. And the man who first showed that clearly and showed what the te techniques are was Milman Parry. His work has been carried on by many people, but most notably by Albert Lord. Uh, Milman Parry discovered by listening to living epic poets in Serbia that they never recited one of their epics exactly the same way twice in succession. What they did was to memorize the plots, they memorized the names of all the characters in the epic, and they memorized a large body of formulas. Uh, there were formulas or set ways of saying the sorts of things that were likely to turn up frequently, the descriptions that would be needed in the course of their description. And then with this knowledge in hand, they stood up before their audience and they spoke in poetry with as much ease as I'm, or probably more ease, than I'm speaking to you right now. Uh, I've left on that chair there, in case some of you would be interested later on, um, uh, some handouts that come from a talk uh, two days ago at the American Oriental Society. It's meeting in San Francisco right now. Uh, and on the first page and the second page, too, you will find uh, a list of some Mahabharata formulas, uh, you can see how uh, the same way of saying things uh, occurs and reoccurs and reoccurs. For example, the one on the, on the front page is for the licking of the lips. Uh, this is a situation that occurs when a warrior is taking aim at his enemy. Often he's just been wounded. Uh, regularly he is furious, uh, red-eyed, and uh, frequently a simile is added. Uh, I'll give you a translation of the, of the first four out of the 40 occurrences that I have there, and you'll see how they all go according to a pattern. The hero licking the corners of his lips like a wolf in the flock. Another one. The hero licking and licking the corners of his lips, his eyes reddened with anger. Or again, licking around the corners of his lips, O king, breathing hard and with eyes red with anger. Again, the hero licking the corners of his lips like a proud tiger. If you have uh, these uh, formulas uh, in the back of your mind, and mind you, they all make good verse. They're all metrical. Uh, why, you can talk in poetry about a vast number of things.
So now, uh, in order to assign the different parts of the Mahabharata to an early stage and a late stage, it's necessary to count up formulaic instances. It's necessary also to count up the instances of certain types of words in certain positions in the line. In formulaic, uh, in oral poetry, uh, such words as aspondi. Aspondi is a word that contains two long syllables, tend to be polarized to the ends of the line because that's the easy place to put them. Uh, other words like the double I am naturally come uh, at a certain point in this uh, Mahabharata meter and they will regularly occur there. If you have time enough to write out uh, a first version of what your poem's going to be <coughs> and then correct it, you can get much more subtle arrangements of words and uh, you can use spondees, for example, in many situations where they seem difficult, where you won't think of them right away. But when it's an ongoing performance, you naturally choose the easy blocks for the natural places and this is one of the characteristics uh, that I used to identify the portions that are written in this oral style. Uh, now, uh, the, wh why is it really very important to, uh, to discover what portions of a very ancient poem were made first and what portions were made second? Uh, this Mahabharata, it concerns at least the narrative line, basically a war between two families of cousins over the possession of a kingdom uh, just north of the modern city of Delhi. Uh, the heroes of the poem are cheated out of the kingdom. Uh, they are forced into exile and uh, they go through various adventures and hardships. They come back and there's a long diplomatic correspondence with their opponents and finally comes the war in which almost everybody is killed. Uh, at the end of the war, there is a long lecture on right and wrong and justice and law from old grandfather Bhishma. And finally at the end, uh, they set off to the Himalayas to climb up to heaven. In the course of all of this, uh, you are given uh, the basic texts of Hindu religion. Many of you will have heard of the Bhagavad Gita, which is a poem in which God incarnate tells the chief hero, uh, Arjuna, why it is his duty to fight in the war, although his family, many members of his family and friends are on the opposite side. And he then goes on to speak of the various ways in which uh, a man can perform his duty on earth or the various ways in which a man can come to know, to, to know God. Uh, in, the, in the twelfth book, you have the, the whole basis of uh, uh, what ancient Indians thought was the purpose of life. It would be a fascinating thing if we could understand this poem uh, not as a complete whole uh, in the way in which medieval theologians understood it, but as the sum of a long process, just as it seems to me fascinating to think of, say, uh, the book of John and the New Testament, uh, not, not simply as uh, the word of God, which is uh, to be uh, harmonized completely with all the other Gospels, but if you can see it as the result of Gnostic movements and you can trace them back and you can see how uh, the Gnosticism affected Christianity, you begin to get a sense of the movement of ideas, the movement of religions, and you come to have an understanding in depth instead of an, an understanding that is without any of this historical dimension. That's why uh, the, I started on the project in the beginning and I can only thank my good karma, as the Indians would say, for having had a son that was able to help me do uh, the thing that I want to do. Now, uh, two things make this making of a concordance difficult. Even after you have 
uh, a computer that can uh, recognize uh, the uh, system of writing in which the critical text of the Mahabharata is printed. The Sanskrit language uh, is a language which makes very numerous euphonic changes uh, between words. Uh, we have them in all languages to some extent. In English, they are not written, but you are aware of them. If you say, did you light the stove, the pronunciation of you is one. But if you say, why'd you light the stove, it's quite a different pronunciation. You get why do you get the J in there. Now, uh, in Sanskrit, all of these small differences must be written in so that if you say having heard it, and you put the having heard first, the thing. Wrong way. <laughs> okay. Uh, the having heard is shrutva but if you reverse the words, it becomes tat shrutva. And uh, it is changes of this sort that give the language a very amorphous aspect, as any of my Sanskrit students will tell you. They spend the first year trying to figure out what word is what. Uh, if you take, uh, well, we take uh, any nominative plural. Uh, we'll take the word for brothers because it happens to be like the English one. Brataras. Now, if I want to say the brothers are standing, uh, this is the form that brataras takes. Brataras distanti. But if I want to say that they are walking, uh, it changes to brataras charanti. If I want to say they're throwing a ball or something, this changes to brataraha, shipanti. I'll just only write the beginning of it. Uh, if I want to say that they're running, it changes to an O, brataro, tavanti. If uh, I want to say they're looking at me, it changes to an A, bratara, ikshanti, iksh, uh, ikshanti, and, and so forth. The, the words assume many forms. And when you combine this with the fact that you have eight cases of the noun in the singular, dual, and plural, <laughs> it, it makes quite a lot to recognize at the beginning. Uh, now, uh, there's a problem in the, the writing of the script in which Sanskrit is written. Uh, the, the text that we are using is published in Devanagari, which is the commonest of the Indian scripts now used. It's the script that's used for Hindi and Marathi, as well as for publications in Sanskrit. Uh, and it, as well as all other uh, alphabets, or they aren't alphabets, as well as all other systems of writing now used in India, is basically a, a syllabary rather than an alphabet. Uh, I can show you how it works. We take the uh, syllables that begin with K. Uh, for simple K-A, short A is the unmarked vowel. You have this sign. If you have a long A, you get a stroke after it. If you have a short I, if you have a long I, and so forth. If you have a ku. Uh, but you, tra you, you write a word syllable by syllable. So if I were to write Mahabharata, I will write it. I'll do it on top so as you can see. Syllable by syllable. This is ma, ha, ba, ra, ta, right? Uh, <laughs> now, uh, when, two, uh, when two consonants come together, you have to make a ligature uh, and uh, uh, for instance, if you have bratara for brothers, it begins B-H-R. You've got to combine the B-H with another sign. Uh, actually, this is, this is R, 
and this is R-A, they don't look very much alike. Uh, B-H-R is a, is a special ligature of these two. Now, when you write a sentence, if I were to write, say, this is the beginning of a famous story. There was a king, Nulla by name, uh, Nalo Namo. Uh, the only place where you, in, where you have a break in the type is where the prior word ends in a vowel and the next word begins in a consonant. Otherwise, the thing will be written solid. Uh, if you're transcribing this, this says there was, Asi, Raja is a king, Nala by name. But you've got to write this, the, the Asid solid. So it just uh, looks like a single word. Now, when you put a computer to reading that, uh, it will come out in transliteration uh, like this, with a space here and a space here. In our concordance, we want all the words that are in the Mahabharata. We want all the components of compounds that are in the Mahabharata. And so we will have to edit in the word breaks. And it's fairly simple to do in this case. You just move this over. But where you have two vowels that coalesce, it gets to be complicated because you have a thing like uh, as if of him, tasya iva, uh, because of the rules of euphony, appears as tasyeva. Now you've got to point your mouse at this and have it <laughs> have it dissolve this into a plus i. But in some cases, such an e vowel will result from a long a plus short i. In some cases, from a short a plus a long i. From some cases, from a long a plus a long i. So you've got these four possibilities. Well, I think maybe I've talked enough about the difficulties. I think we'd better get to the fellow who solved them. <laughs> here, you want this, Danny? Uh, I I'm going to be over here. Can people hear that? OK. Is there a volume control here? OK, how's that? Uh, can we have this, the lights off? Because I'm going to do this mostly all with slides, and I think that the lights will just be an interference. <laughs> yes, I can. Should I turn this back down? Hey, you want this, don't you? No. Oh. Oops, this comes with. Are you going to turn off the light? Because it's real hard for me to see with the screen. Uh, when I looked at the problem of, of how we could uh, transliterate the Devanagari script, uh, the first thing to do is to find a scanner. And at that time, Jasmines weren't around. Uh, and Bob Hunt had just modified the TC200 telecopier so that it could feed its information into an alto. And uh, so here is a picture of the TC200. And uh, this is for another audience that hasn't seen altos. There's a picture of the alto. Uh, and they're cabled together. And what you basically get, the TC200 scans a page of text uh, at 240 dots per inch resolution. So that's about twice the width of a human hair per dot, which seems real fine until you start looking at text. And you'll see many examples following how the text looks. Uh, but it, it really turns out to be quite workable. Uh, and that the page of text comes in and gets put on the disk, and then it can be worked on by programs. And I've done all of my work in the Smalltalk system just to make it easy to try it out. Uh, and it runs real slow, but it's, it's, it's provided an opportunity to actually uh, solve the problem. This is the text that we're working with. And uh, here's a typical page. And I wanted to show you this just to show you that um, there's 
there's a significant part of the problem is simply locating the lines of text on the page. You see, you've got page headings, which you don't care about, and then here comes the text that you do care about. Um, it's in two-column format. Uh, and then there's this little fiducial down here and then commentary below that. Uh, and in addition, just to make things interesting, there are these little squiggles here under things, which and they relate to footnotes here, where there are alternative interpretations, because this is a critical text, so it includes s um, several different sor uh, sources. Now, uh, the two-column format also is worse because you get these breaks between chapters, uh, where this is column one and it completes there, and then the next chapter begins here, column one and column two. So you have to deal with all that page layout. But that's, I mean, you just do it and then it's done. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an example of the text after it's been scanned in. Uh, and you can see, now here you can see the Devanagari, how it looks when it's printed. And uh, the, the, first, the first task in getting on with character recognition is to locate the lines on the page. So I do this by taking a thin, one of the primitives that just gets used again and again in the process of doing this image recognition. And this is probably different from what you would do, well, you might do the same thing in grayscale work, but with, with text that's just black or white, um, make up a thin rectangle and count the number of dots that are black in it. And that allows you to decompose pictures. So the first thing I do is to make a thin rectangle, which is a slice across the page, and then it's actually not across the page, across the column. And then move it down the page each time counting up the number of dots on in it. And that gives you a profile that's like this on the left. Okay, so here I've, I've plotted a, a black area that's as long as the number of dots there. So you can see that these glumps are the lines with essentially zero counts in between. That then allows you to take a look at an individual line. You can then take a thin slice vertically and run that horizontally across the line, and you'll find these zero counts between the actual words, the words that are shown. Where they're where shown, they show, where they right. do show, right? Uh, so that will allow you to locate the first word, and then you can pr repeat the process on this to come down with another thin slice vertically through here. See, there, the page may not be perfectly horizontal, or even if it is, the type probably won't be because these are all pretty much manually typeset. Uh, <coughs> so you you do this again, and that allows you to find this horizontal bar. It's called the matra. And uh, you can recognize that by this peak. And once having recognized that, you can then take a look at the two separate boxes, which represent the area where most of the consonants are and this area above where the uh, vowel inflections are. And, uh, and what I've done here in this picture is to show you the result of then going through the lower area and getting its weight. So here you actually see the breaks between the characters here. This is, happens to be a nice example. You can, they're all zero in between. Uh, and then on the top here, also for those two characters. And the final result, then, is to draw, draw boxes around them. And you can you scan down within a character. You go down until you find that it's all white. And that allows you to draw the bounding box. So then the next thing you have to do is to now, now what you've got is you've got the right dots, and you have to figure out what the dots are. So the, the way that I tackled this problem was to, was to have a model which would learn the set, uh, the, the type, the font in which the text was set. And the way I've done that is to, to you, you go through and box a bunch of characters, and then you manually identify them. And the model that I've chosen for representing the characters is what I call a skin and bones model. Uh, when you see the first, this is the, this is the glyph for ta. When you, s when you see the first one, that becomes the only thing you know about it. When you see another example of it, then what you can do is, is basically or them together and and them together. In other words, here you produce an image which is black where, it, where either of them may be black. And this one here is black where they both are black. And you continue that with success, successive examples that you encounter. 
See, this one was slurred over at the bottom. It doesn't show the break. So in the skin, you have to allow for the case that there, won't, that there will be black in there. And similarly, the bones has got this little nick there. So, and it's, it's interesting. You actually you learn about the, the actual pieces of type that, uh, that they had. Because <laughs> and and uh, Dad took quite a while in, in, uh, in the beginning of this project uh, figuring out a dictionary of all the ligatures, that is, the combined characters that were used in this font. And uh, in fact, the program just discovered them automatically. Uh, that was very gratifying. <laughs> now here, here are a couple of uh, unknowns about to be recognized. These are two tas, and this one you'll see is broken. It doesn't matter too much. And there's a process that has to go on before you actually do the scoring, uh, which is that you have to align the incoming unknown character with respect to the master representation. And uh, so this, let's see, this may be a little bit confusing, but this started out with all the nine possible alignments, okay, the, laying it straight over or shifting it by one this direction, shifting it by one that direction, and so on. And so it tried all those alignments. And of all those, it liked this one best. And so having liked this one better, it went on to check the ones adjacent to it. And it liked this one even better. The, the dots here are the ones where they differed, just by a simple exclusive or. Um, and then having liked this one better, it checked out these three. And you see here, it's shifting over too far. You're getting black areas on the side. And so this was selected as the final correct alignment. Exclusive or of the, of the uh, stimulus with skin? Or with well, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Th this is a, what I actually do is to, is to compare both the skin and the bones, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but I just did this picture with an exclusive or so you could see the alignment. Um, well, I, I will talk about it right now. The, the way that I finally score the things is that it's bad if an unknown has a dot on where the skin does not have a dot on, because that's lying outside of the region where most of those characters do have black. And similarly, it's bad if a character is missing something that has a white place where the bones are has, has a black place, because that means it's missing something which you encountered in all the ones that you identified. Uh, and then you just add those two scores. And uh, I don't know why I got into this negative view of things, but that's how bad it is, so the lowest score wins. <laughs> <laughs> do you worry about rotations? Or is it I do not worry about rotations. I don't even do them. <laughs> Does that hurt you? No. Okay. No. The, uh, they're all pretty much straight. And uh, if, you know, if one in a 1,000 got really skewed, that would be OK. Uh, I mean, we're, wi we're willing to tolerate a few errors. Now, here's an example of an incoming unknown to be recognized. It is a ta. And it gets compared. Here's the skin and the bones uh, of, f first of all, there, uh, there's an initial process where you say, is this reasonably close to uh, one of the masters. And that involves a check on the size of the bounding box and also, uh, and also on a quick version of this scoring without any test for alignment. And these were the winners. Uh, so you can see that they're sort of similar. Uh, this is a na, this is a ta-ta, and, and so on down here. They all look somewhat like it. And, uh, and here are the res here's the result of finding the bits that were on here but not on in the skin. So that's bad. And similarly, these are the ones that uh, were not on here that were on in the bones. And so there it is for each of these. And the final one, which was a, it's, well, that it's kind of poorly focused, which is the correct one. You'll see there's just a couple of dots there and one there. So that one. And that's how it works. So then you end up with the, the word or segment. Uh, with, the with the characters identified with their correct transliteration. And then there's a further process that goes on, which is basically putting together the way that the vowels are spread around the syllables. So that uh, uh, here, this upper glyph, which represents either an O or an E, uh, got uh, this part of the program is very heuristic. I, I did it in a hurry, and it's not actually done uniformly, but it does the correct thing. Uh, <laughs> this, this top piece together with that bottom piece ends up making effectively an A, uh, effectively an E, and that together with the A-ness that's in this makes effectively an O. 
and uh, and similarly this m dot thing here gets put on the end and uh, it, it's really been fun doing this because you know computers inside them don't have any idea of what you're doing and <laughs> and I'm in that relationship to this project you know <laughs> This is just a piece of the small talk code, and I, I actually won't say anything about it, except that, you know, this is the part for doing that transliteration. And it has, it's just a bunch of, you know, special cases. If the, if the top part uh, con contains an O part of the glyph, then do thus and such. And uh, so this is another place where there's just a bunch of special cases similar to the dealing with the page layout. This is the character layout. Uh, here's another example that just shows a bit more of what you have to do. Uh, you get these compound glyphs. This is an R hook, and this is an I hook. And this I hook goes with this piece, and this R hook goes actually before this consonant, sort of in there. And you can figure that out by the horizontal coordinates. Uh, so in, in that case, see this R hook, it got figured out that it went before the R, and that this piece here uh, end, ended up making an I here, and, uh, and so it goes. And uh, so that allows you to get the. Uh, oh, let's see. I've got some stuff in here ab about uh, just various difficulties that arose. This is a b, and this is a ma, and uh, you'll see they're almost identical. If you're lucky with a b, it's missing this little piece there, um, but often you're not, and so they look almost identical, and it, they can look identical, or at least you can't tell them apart. Uh, <laughs> however. <laughs> However, if, if you're lucky, the ba will always have a broken matra up here. So there's some special rules in there for checking for that in certain cases. Is that an idiosyncrasy with the type? Is that what you're talking You mean that, yes. The broken matra? Yeah. No, no, that should no, be no, there. That's, that should be there. Right, I see, yes. Um, and then there are, there are things that get put together. Uh, for instance, this is, a, a, this is the hook of the T, and this is a, a, a ya. So this together means tia. And by my simple algorithm, I can't split those apart. And so for cases like that, and, and in fact, it's sort of reasonable that I can't because that was a single type slug. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so we just augment the alphabet, and that makes it very simple. Uh, then there's, there's, uh, there's another problem that comes up here, which is that although it is a separate piece of type, the ligatures that have this long U vowel still are kerned underneath the next character. And that, for the simple boxing, that screws things up. So what I did was I just basically uh, did the boxing only down to such a level that would typically not include the kerning of the U. And that turned out to not degrade the recognition because this big glump here was still pretty characteristic of a long U uh, and, and yet allowed the boxing to, to work properly. Uh, that's just another example. Uh, oh yeah, there's, here's, here's a kind of thing that can go wrong, which is this is a, a representation of basically KTA, but it's written in a kind of a funny way. If you look at this glyph separately, and in this case the program thought that it was separate, this represents a TTA and this a KA. Uh, no, just a K, I guess. And, uh, and so I had to put in a special rule. It, it would be impossible to, ha to have t -t -k so, so when you see those two things together, it undoes it, knowing <laughs> what it should have been. Uh, so, you, so you end up with the, the transliteration as desired. Now, as, as my father explained to you, for the purposes of the concordance, you want to break down the, the segments of type further into the actual word breaks. And this is, so I've just got a couple of slides showing that. And basically there, I'll just zip through it. Here, this O. Uh, you select, uh, and and then you indicate the kind of break. Uh, is this a stem break? Uh, that was within a compound. Right, yeah. uh, the break be uh, between two stems in a compound, and that got split up into an AU. And uh, <coughs> and similarly here, this got broken up. Uh, there was no no splitting of the vowel there. And so you just continue in this process. Here, there was an actual word break there. And here, the, uh, 
I'm just going to hold on to the whole schmear. Great, thanks. And uh, here's the long A to be broken up. And in this case, uh, it wants to, the second A wants to be lengthened. So that's taken care of basically by, uh, by having a couple of keys on the key set, which you push down. In, you push the one on the left if you want the left vowel lengthened, and the one on the right if you want the right vowel lengthened uh, at the time that you indicate the break. And then uh, also you get errors. Like here, there was a question mark. It couldn't recognize something. And you're lucky if you get a question mark. Usually what you just get is the wrong thing. Uh, <laughs> so you get to uh, select that and replace it with the correct characters. And uh, let's see. Oh, the, I've got a couple of these slides are where they shouldn't be. Uh, just a second. Uh, this thing is going backwards. It's about the equipment here. Uh, I'm about to get there. You can uh, position it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Just a second. Well, I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to stop and say a couple of things, uh, which is that. That takes care of getting the transliterated text. And uh, there's some other work that's been, that's been done here, which, which I think is kind of exciting, uh, which is uh, Chris Jeffers, who worked in Nepal in the Peace Corps, uh, made essentially a Devanagari typewriter at one point uh, in the small talk system. And, uh, and I think that that could be refined on. The, it's interesting that it's quite costly right now, uh, or, or difficult, to set Devanagari type. And as a result, uh, there's either there are small amounts of it available or it's low quality. And, uh, and I think that there's something that could be done. For instance, any of this stuff, once scanned in, could be reprinted in really high quality if you wanted to do that. Um, and also, Yo Yogan Dalal knows something about that. So if anybody's interested in that stuff, they could talk to those people. Um, I then took, uh, I thought it would be interesting to see how these algorithms would work on English text. And uh, so I did that for, for uh, a couple of samples of English text. And I'm, going to, uh, I'm just going to persist here for a minute and try and get the slides, because the slides will show that nicely. So bear with me. I just know that there's a slide in that region. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's working. Right. I'll go by tens. Okay, that's working. Okay. Ray. That's really surprising. Well, I will just tell you how the English stuff uh, worked, which is that uh, I took a really junky piece of uh, type. It was actually uh, it was nice text, but scanned in very poorly. It was a letter that my father sent me. And it was typed on Caraceable Bond with, uh, with a poor typewriter. And for that, it got about, let's see, I, I wrote it down. I've kind of forgotten. It was a sample of 2,700 characters, and it missed 50. <coughs> So that that gives you uh, about 98% uh, accuracy. So I thought that was pretty good. And it was also fun looking through that, because in the process, it, it didn't do too well for several things. And uh, as a result of fixing those, it improved things for the Sanskrit as well. Um, how, many <coughs> training, how, many training, uh, how many characters went to make up the skin and bones of each character? Um, I've just been using four. Uh, and the, uh, I. I was going to go to more, but whenever, the, whenever the, uh, the examples are poor, what happens is the bones just get totally depleted and, and don't do much good. Uh, but that, that definitely was responsible for uh, some of the problem with that piece of text. And so then I took a nice, clean piece of text, and it was printed in Gotcha 10 here, and, uh, and scanned that in. 
And that out of a sample of 5,700 characters missed five. So it's 0.1%. It's just totally usable. Um, it's it, it goes fairly slow. It goes uh, glacially in small talk. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but basically, all the operations are done with this primitive here called bitblit. And uh, so that it can run quite fast. And, uh, and we definitely plan to speed that all up with, uh, when we start reading in these uh, 200,000 verses. Did you try it on the Dorado? Uh, I did. It goes much faster on the Dorado. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so just, just the bit split times on, on an alto would have it be around seven minutes for a page of the Devanagari script. And, uh, and the TC200 takes about 10 or 20 seconds per page. So, so uh, there's an additional factor there of you know, 10 or 20 that you'd like to, uh, to pick up. And what I would like to do, it's the actual recognition stuff for given a line of text is a really small piece of program together with the table of the skin and bones. And I thought it would be really fun to just write that little piece of program in a way that it could be squirted out over the ether. Uh, that's something that connects all the computers. Uh, to, uh, so that you could then just, when you read in a page of text, you could just send the lines, the, the lines of text out to each of these machines. They would uh, recognize the characters in them. Then you could go pull them around and get the results all in about the time it took to scan the page. That's right, a useful worm. <laughs> so that summarizes uh, what I had to tell you. And uh, we'd both be happy to entertain questions. Yeah. No, we, we, but we just had a very interesting talk with Martin Kay and Ron Kaplan uh, today about that. And uh, from the text that my father typed in manually, we have an ind there, there is a sample body of text that has already had that done. Uh, and so we're going to provide that to him with and without uh, the appropriate splitting and see if, if, if it's easy to discover uh, simple things to do. Yeah. No, not really. Uh, it, it, the box around the character is. Um, that, that limits it. And, and my sense is that, no, no, the answer is no. Um, and that's something you could do, and it would be interesting to do that. Uh, that's right. Well, it, it, uh, it comes down to the statistics of where the program spends its time. And, and that's still sort of uh, artificial because of the extra level of simulation. and. Uh, that is that's something that would be really worth looking at when we get into production. Yeah? Is there any correlation between the number of dots in the character and its phonetic position? I don't know. I don't know. The, the number of dots in a character is definitely a feature you can use for, for early rejection. Uh, and I, I, my father says no. Yeah? Oh, uh, one of the things was that uh, just taking the two bad features left out, uh, it's sort of appropriate, you know. The, um, there should also be basically a reward for the good bits. And, and that became significant uh, when I started working on this, this really poor example of typing, because the bones just got to be totally depleted, and, uh, and it, would not, it would not recognize well. So including that additional. Uh, piece of information. It takes a little bit longer, but it makes it uh, about twice as good. So it was not a function of it being English, but only That's right. low quality English. Yeah, yeah it was uh, a flaw in the initial uh, way of doing things. Yeah. Any, yeah? When you get into production, is, is it your idea that the program that's going to be squirted out will be written in, in microcode or in BCDL or something like that, Mesa, and, and, and then the, the, we'll still have small talk in charge? Yeah, I don't know where Smalltalk will remain. Certainly for stuff such as uh, learning the font can remain in Smalltalk because that doesn't enter into the production process at all. My guess is that everything else will want to be BCPL or Mesa just because it's got to go fast. And, or, or Smalltalk may get faster. <laughs>
The Kurzweil is, is uh, mostly a feature-driven. I, I just had a brief conversation with one of their guys. Mostly a feature-driven thing. Um, they do something similar to this when the f uh, in their learning process if the feature thing gets confused. Uh, and then there, I think that there's, there's been some other work that has a, a representation similar to the skin and bones. And I, I basically didn't know anything about how people did this. Uh, and, and I still don't know much about it. And, but I, I think it's a valid technique, but I don't think it's as fast as some others. Uh, and I think that for any, any of these things, you really need hardware if you want to go at the kinds of useful speeds that people would want in an office. Uh, yeah? Uh, how long do you anticipate it will take to get the whole test done? Well, we were thinking about a year. And that was w without the assumption that there would be a program to help with the breaks. In other words, uh, it, it should take a little bit longer to to insert the brakes than to basically read it slowly. And my father figured that over the course of a year he could do that. Again? This is sort of a question for, for, for your father. Uh, it, what, once you've gotten that output, um, how long will it take you to complete your research on getting the, the, con the concordance done and, and that sort of thing? Because if the answer is you know, oh, the, the, Yeah, the, after the concordance is done, how long will it take? Once you get the output, will that give you that is the concordance? I mean, the yes, that the is the concordance. Uh, then, uh, well, okay. Are you going to have to go blind sitting at a terminal for a long time to get to that point? Oh, no, I think we can get it printed so that you can have it on your desk. I see. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, it could take, uh, you, you can keep working at it a long time. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I will get the direct answers I wanted pretty quickly. But uh, then there are all kinds of refinements you can, you can make, and there's material here for other people to go on with for a very long while. If I can get the, the main assignment of the portions to uh, chronological layers so that I can write a history of the genesis of the work, that's what I want to do. Then other people can go on for a century. <laughs> That's it.